You're watching La Chaine. witnessing a rather remarkable phenomena. This is the space car of the future. We are in this manner showing you the reality of the meaning of extraterrestrial intelligence and the arrival of space craft and the brothers who are upon these craft from other planes. Hmm. Greetings, prisoners of gravity. This is your brother from another plane, Commander Rick. From invasion of the body snatchers to chariots of the goofs, let's talk about first contact. Anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe has voted the English only five hundred forty thousand tons of oil with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Conceivable that a spherical ship will land in front of the Washington Monument and a figure with four antennas and otherwise looking like the uh, professional football player will walk out <laughs> and demand to see our leader. But I, I hope uh, very much that the, the universe of circumstance is wider than the rather shoddy imaginations of science fiction writers for 30 or 40 years. And I'm pretty convinced it is. He's got a point. Last night, I tuned in a Star Trek festival on Hong Kong TV, and every episode, they encountered another alien race who spoke perfect Cantonese. Come on. Wouldn't some aliens speak Mandarin or Farsi or Swahili? In one of his last editorials, Isaac Asimov blamed TV for humanizing aliens. They look like guys in rubber suits because that's all we can afford. I mean... Back when TV was still science fiction, H.G. Wells imagined slimy three-legged Martians. And later, John Wyndham invented mobile plants with these deadly stingers. And astronomer Fred Hoyle created a sentient ball of space dust. But too many SF writers start with a person and then just stick on a few animal parts. I mean, that's not creating aliens, that's playing Mr. Potato Head. I mean, the only distinguishing feature of the invaders on the old TV show Invaders was that their pinkies didn't bend. I'm from space. Oh, I'm from Vulcan. Oh, yeah, I'm from New York. Canadian SF author J. Brian Clark wrote about human-like aliens called the Foolie in a series of stories that were packaged into the novel The Expediter. Brian, are there sufficient scientific grounds for the sort of parallel evolution that causes so many of SF's aliens to be humanoid? I think so, because our, uh, our human, humanoid shape is very logical. To start with, um, I cannot imagine, for instance, an intelligent lobster, because physic you've got an, you need physical dexterity to start with. So an internal skeleton becomes quite necessary. It needs to be an air-breathing creature, not a water-breathing creature, because you cannot build a, a, a technical civilization underwater. Um, the idea of being upright, well, that's, that's natural enough, because uh, it places the eyes at the top of the head where you can see much further afield detect your enemies. There's, there's, a, a, there's a logic to every, logic to the humanoid shape, a, a lot of logic. And uh, in other words, I very much doubt intelligent insects. Um, 
Whether or not these pure beings are pure energy, I have my doubts about that, although there would be some excellent stories written among those things. So, I, as I say, I would expect humanoid, but humanoid can mean an awful lot of things. For more alien-looking aliens, check out Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. It's a gallery of classic science fiction creatures. And you thought your yearbook photo was ugly. One of the key inventors of exotic aliens is SF author Hal Clement. For example, in his classic novel, Mission of Gravity, flat, worm-like creatures have evolved on Mesklin, a planet with very high gravity. A teacher with degrees in astronomy and chemistry, Hal's secret is to make each alien a product of an unearthly environment. So when Ben Bova assembled First Contact, a collection of science fiction and fact about extraterrestrial intelligence, he naturally chose Hal to write the chapter on alternate life designs. Hal, it's Commander Rick. You've written about life evolving under bizarre conditions. What are the basics needed for life? In my opinion, which is rather broad compared to those in the, you'll see in a lot of books, it needs complicated chemistry. It's uh, machinery. It has to do certain very complex things, grow, repair itself, reproduce itself. Now, I don't see how these can be done without quite complex molecular machinery. And to me, this requires liquid, solution chemistry. Uh, gases uh, can be nice and complicated, but you can't build definite structures out of them. It's just not the nature of a gas. You can build all the structures you like out of solids, but they can't move around and do active things, which a, a living thing, as we picture life, needs. So I've always visualized living creatures as Having a liquid base, water's the only one we know will work, but I'm willing to argue strongly for liquid ammonia and not quite so strongly for a number of other liquids. I've written articles uh, defending uh, uh, hydrogen fluoride, uh, methane, liquid nitrogen, uh, even liquid hydrogen, if you really want a chilly planet and your story requires life on it. Like Attack of the Popsicle People. Your article didn't delve into the odds that aliens would be humanoid. There have been articles written about this, not by me in this particular case. The best one was by Sprague de Camp 40 years or so ago. Uh, he concluded that the humanoid shape was the most likely for an intelligent being, and the reaction of many of us to that was to uh, make other shapes intelligent and try to justify it. We took the article as a challenge. Well, since then, you've dreamed up a menagerie of aliens. What intrigues you most about this speculation? I'm not quite sure. It is, the speculation itself is fun, trying to see what might reasonably be there. And there's always the hope that we'll actually run into some such organism, not only through CETI, uh, hearing a radio message from it, but actually in close enough physical contact to see it. And there's that remote but dazzling possibility that I might turn out to be right. Perhaps. Good luck. And thanks, Hal. The First Contact collection is full of intriguing speculation. And unlike, say, Chariots of the Gods, it's grounded in scientific reality. That's doubtless due to co-editor Ben Boba, a hard SF author who worked for the American Space Program and edited Omni magazine. Ben, what was the mandate of First Contact? Make money. <laughs> OK, and did it? Uh, yes, it's doing very well, as a matter of fact. Good. The idea of the book was to do an up-to-date book about the possibilities of finding extraterrestrial intelligence, not just life, but intelligence and have the book written as much as possible by the people who are actually doing the work. And I think it was a very successful uh, effort in that regard. And uh, it was not only fun to do, but I think it's it's a very instructive book, probably the best of its type since uh, Sagan and Shklovsky did uh, uh, extraterrestrial life back in the 